Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Press one of these. HDMI 3. Oh, you'll do it. Okay, cool. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited. Almost stripped over a cable. That's not a really good start. But I would have had it on four cameras, so it would have been like, you know, good bloopers to over a cable and pull my laptop off. Thank you so much for coming. Really excited to have you here. Don't stand under the speaker. I remember Joe saying that. So tonight we're going to do Cypress and Cucumber. But before I do that, I'm just going to talk about some of the important building information that we have to do every time. There are drinks at the back um, and help, help yourself, just at the back on the left. Toilets are at the back on the right, so when you came in through the double doors on your left. I'm not going to read this out. I want to pull out the important parts. As I said last time, as some of you remember, some familiar faces. If there's a fire, get out, but do push your code first. If it's a Mac, take it with you. If it's a PC, just leave it here. Who cares? It's fine. We're at Microsoft, aren't I? I shouldn't say that. If it's a Mac, leave it here. Um, the most important part is the assembly point, which is every time I get this wrong, when you come out of here, turn left. Is that correct? It's right? OK. Oh, yes. Well, sorry. I thought we were the other player side. I'll follow you. It's fine. Uh, incidents, first aid, report them immediately. Um, yeah, that's basically it, really. And no smoking. Obvious stuff. Brilliant. Let's get into the exciting part. So as usual, I will do stand here and look pretty, and Andrew will do all the hard work. He's actually just. Uh, updating his demo now because we broke it just before we came. We thought it would be smart, and we busted it. So he's hopefully going to fix it now. But we won't tell anyone this is not being live streamed on Microsoft's channel uh, or being recorded, so it's fine. So who here has used Cypress or Cucumber? OK, which one? Cypress? Yeah, Cucumber? OK, cool. So you can, you can help us when we get stuck in our demo. So who knows what Cypress is? The people who didn't put their hands up, do you know what it is? Have you kind of watched a video on it or seen a talk? OK. So today's overview, this is really rough, and I've tweaked it since from last time, is because last time um, we took a bit longer than usual. So um, I kind of allow a bit of space. We're hoping, it again, at the end, to have it so you can maybe do some work on your own projects, maybe install Cypress as a dependency and get it running, and we can walk around and, and have a go. So let's see how it looks. So if anyone wants to come up and show their project and uh, help at the end and wants to ask questions to the audience, then we can do things like that, and we can try and help um, do any, I don't know, challenging things that you have. So just a bit of an intro to why kind of automated testing is really important. So who here does manual testing? Is, is that instead of or in addition to? OK. So the, the problem I have, I guess, the problem with manual testing is it takes a lot of time. And if you make a small change and it changes a lot of places, you don't want to go through and manually check all that, all the happy path, the boundary conditions, and all, the, all those. There, there are, I guess, some parts you do want to do that too. But generally speaking, if you make a small change, you don't want to manually go through that. We have on our current client's project, it's like 1,000 tests Andrew, I think, and that takes a few minutes to run. And to do that manually would take a lot of people a lot of hours to do. And when, when you do that, if, if it was um, someone doing that, it's prone to error. You, know, you can't guarantee you're going to do the same test exactly the same time every day, every week you've done over the last year or so. And also regression. I think it's really important that when you make a change in one area that your CI runs the entire suite. So locally, you might only run that module or that area, but at least your CI is going to run the entire suite, which I think is really important. If you have any questions or any ideas, any suggestions, then please just yell it out. I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not precious. I'm up here to start the conversation. I don't think I have all the answers. And every time I do a talk or whatever the topic is, usually around open source, 
I always learn something new. So please just ask a question to someone else. If I can't answer it, someone else in the audience might be able to answer it. So as I mentioned, the, kind of the flip side, we've got faster feedback. It'd be really, it's really important to get those hundreds of tests, get feedback as fast as possible. And in our first, uh, two meetups ago, so in our first one that we did, we also spoke about how you can make some optimizations. So things like, say if you're, you have one test that needs to test the login, you're going to test can you log in successfully? Can you test that you log in unsuccessfully and all the other different conditions? You might have five or six different conditions. But when you say you want to I know, create an event, you need to be logged in to do that. You might have one event test that checks that you do log in and then you go create the event. But when you start doing all the other boundary tests around the event, you can always mock out the login because you don't need to retest that you can log in every single time because if it's a real login, it, take, it takes time to do it. So there are performance improvements that can be made uh, as and when they need to be. So people who said they run Cypress or automated testing, does anyone run code coverage? Yeah, so that's really useful because you get to see what you've missed, which is always, I find, a lot more. Especially with the boundary conditions, you think you've covered everything and you realize that, that you haven't. I'm guessing yours is similar. It's really useful. Uh, and did you say you use yours with Cucumber? Okay, not using this piece of okay. Okay. So what I find with using it with Cucumber, it's really good to, uh, which I'm going to go into in, in another slide, but I think it's really good, you can use it as documentation, you can see what kind of features you've got, because it's written in plain English. And who's familiar with the format of Cucumber? Okay, most people. If not, I've, if I assume something, please ask the question and say, but I've got some examples coming up. So features of Cypress. I did say I love open source, and the first point I put had to be open source. Um, I really believe that every project is for a client or for my own personal project, or side project, or startup, that I always think, why should it be closed source? For me, open source is like the default. So that's why that's first. Also with Cypress, again, you will probably be familiar with this, but you get the history as it runs through the test. You can go back through the, the steps, and uh, Andrew will show you actual uh, practical example of this, and you can see how it was before that step ran. So if there is an error, you can see, well, what happened before? And also take screenshots and videos. Yes, you'll see the browser running and driving on your, on your laptop, but if you have it running headless on CI you don't, and it fails, you won't actually see what the failure is. So if you save those artifacts on your CI, then you can see a screenshot or you can actually see a video of the test running as if it was running on your computer and you can see uh, how and why it failed. And time travel. So who here hates testing dates? I do, like say if you say had, show me the last, I don't know, the most recent 10, whatever it is, transactions, if you're thinking about a bank account, then if you've got mock data and you've got the date from a month ago when you did, when you wrote that test, then new data might supersede it as being created as part of the other tests. So therefore with time travel, you can manipulate the actual, the date and time. So it can look like the most recent. Has anyone here used Faker? or anything like that. Nice, nice. So Faker, for the ones not familiar, I really enjoy using that. It creates mock data for you, so it's not, so it's a bit more realistic. Rather than me saying, okay, I need to put in an address, I'm gonna use uh, address line one for the first entry, address line two for the second entry, and it's the same every time. With Faker, it can create names, it can create emails, it can create addresses, and on one of our, that's not good, um, on one of our Code Combat live streams, Andrew and me did last week, uh, on the, I think the fourth or fifth edition of the Code Combat, I introduced Faker into my automated tests to see if in two hours I could get that set up and working, and it was creating that, that data. So yeah, Faker's a really good one, definitely look into it. I don't think we're gonna cover that today, but if anyone wants to see that in the future, we can, that's something we can dig into deeper. Okay, should be another slide, no? I thought I had more slides, I was thinking, that's not it. So features of Cucumber, so I really like the idea that it bridges the gap and, and, and encourages collaboration between the core team members and also the wider team. It just brings everyone closer together because, I mean, we worked at one place, Andrew and myself on a previous client, where we actually had it where the, the client, the product owner or the business analyst could actually make a test to a change, uh, sorry, a change to a test 
and then they would raise a PR, all using the uh, GitHub UI, so for a non-technical person. And they wanted, for example, after you logged in, they wanted it to go to a different page. When you logged in at the moment, it went to your accounts page, but they actually wanted to go to the dashboard page. So they could go look at the Cucumber test, and I've got an example coming up, and they could say, um, you know, go to the, uh, the dashboard page after logging in. And they raised a PR, and obviously it failed, because that's not what happened in the code. And we could see that the PR had failed. We could look why it failed, and we see they've updated the test. And that way, we could fix the code, or say fix the code, update the code. The PR are passed, and when they're ready, they could accept it and merge it, and it deployed straight to production. So that way, I'm not saying don't have those conversations, but you're having the conversations about the important, more interesting stuff, not about, I want to navigate to a different page. You know, that's kind of boring. Why have a, a discussion over that? So I really like the idea how it bridges it all together. And again, it's, it's living documentation. It, it saves having to write a lot of documentation. And I can't say this word. Can anyone say this word for me, please? Ubiquitous. Is that, is that correct? OK, cool. Um, so it's having the same terminology, having everyone speaking using the same words rather than the terminology having five or six different words. And sometimes it means something different. I've had ones, I mean, just off the top of my head, think of examples where people said, it's the project page or it's the dashboard page or it's the project dashboard page. And they're all the same thing and it's, it's a bit confusing, especially onboarding new people. Okay. So I've got some uh, commands, examples. Again, I want to skip over this. I don't think Andrew's going to cover this. So I don't think we've got overlap. No, Andrew's looking not sure, so okay, I see. So just to install it on a, on a, on a, um, on a project with uh, NPM, it's really, really easy. It's just literally install Cypress. And then when you open Cypress, it will create the relevant folders that you need with some test examples in there. So you can delete those. And also, it puts it into a Cypress folder, which some people like to rename. I know I like to rename it to test. And then there is config, you can rename it. And the, rec the first thing I recommend doing is saying running all specs, just make sure it runs and it's downloaded properly. Installing Cucumber, a little bit more work on this. So again, it's an NPM install, and it's a, it's a safe dev, and it's um, a Cypress plugin. But then in uh, the Cypress plugins index file, you just need to add an excuse in not looking in code blocks or whatever. You just need to add uh, these two lines, dead simple. And then third step in cypress.json, which will be in the root, which will all be created for you. You add this, because this is what we're going to use for our feature files. And then your package JSON, add that. And I've squished it onto one line just uh, for the slide. This is what a Cucumber test looks like. And the great thing is, who here has heard of page object models? Oh, brilliant. OK, great. It's about half. So page object modules, models allows you to abstract uh, your, co your tests from the page. So if something changes on the page, and you've got five or six tests testing that page, it allows you just to change it in one location, update it all. That's actually not needed because you've got Cucumber as your abstraction. So it's no longer, you could use it if you really wanted that extra abstraction, but it's probably not needed. Because when you say, so this is the feature file. So this might be contact form dot feature. And this bit at the top is just an English description. And same with this one here as well. So this will, this will be, um, so you can have multiple scenarios under the feature. But the important part is this, a so given, it's given when, then, and then you can add to any step and and. I don't know why that one's not indented. Sorry, that should be indented. So um, the given is kind of what you want to have starting the test. So given uh, the contact page is open. Therefore, anyone can reuse this line and say given the home page, dashboard page, or whatever it is. And so you get a lot of reuse out of these, out of these lines. And then it's your next step. So it's the, uh, it's the action. So when the name uh, input field is set to code mortals, so the name, and Andrew's going to show you a real demo of this. This is me just kind of giving a bit of intro to it. So like I said, Andrew does all the hard work, and I, I just uh, take do all the easy stuff. So it will set the input field. And you actually see that in your browser, on your computer. If you're not running it headless, you'll see uh, the input field name is set to code mortals. And you can do and for your email, and for you're just duplicating this line. But we're not, without the when, you're just going to use and. And then at the end of that, you might say, and the send button is clicked. And again, this can be changed for cancel. It can be changed for whatever you want. 
Give me one second. I should have changed my uh, timeout. I think this happened last time, maybe, as well. And then this is the, the result. Uh, the message is, uh, the mes um, then the message sent text is displayed. And you could be specific. You could have a line that has optional um, CSS selector, so you could be specific about where it appears on the page if you want, or you could have it check the whole page just to say it appears. So the more specific you are, the more accurate your test would be, but the more fragile it will be. So it's having that, that balance. Okay. Oh, I think this is Andrew's part now. How's it, how's it looking, Andrew? Is it fixed? I can talk for a few more minutes. How am I doing on time? Uh, okay, so Andrew's going to probably show some navigation tests, just so it can go around the navigation, check all the links work, make sure you end up on the right page. Also, um, form population, so populate the form. Again, not with Faker, but that's something we can do in the future. And then submitting the form and potentially mocking an API call. This is what we broke, so you might not have that. Questions? Any questions? Yeah. That's a good question. I'm going to probably share this answer with Andrew because we, we do this slightly differently. I think it's good to kind of see different points of view. I don't know if there is a definite right answer. Um, and you can move them around. So I like to have it um, under the feature folder. Then I'll do it on a page or a module. It depends how big the project is. So I might have it so that uh, it will be the page. And then under that are all the feature files. But then if there's a certain area that's got a lot of tests and the, and the file's getting too long, I uh, just spit them out again and they maybe have the happy file kind of tests, the successful ones and then the unsuccessful ones. So I might make a subfolder again under that. So, but you can move them around because you wouldn't have to update any of the step definitions, you wouldn't have to update any of the config. So feel free to experiment is what I, I believe. It's under that feature folder, you can move things around, they'll, they'll still run because I think I had a config file uh, yeah, here. So it's going to look uh, recursively in there. So feel free to move it around. I, th I would say be consistent. That's my, I guess, my only biggest suggestion is, is be consistent because if it's not consistent, then it's, it's more difficult uh, for new people. Any other questions? Now everyone knows what Cypress is. Everyone knows what Cucumber is. You think it's amazing, right? And you're going to start using it if you're not using it already? No? OK. Well, hopefully, after you see the demo and you see like, the browser being driven, there are some downsides. So actually, before you, you start, I want to talk about some of the negatives, I suppose. Or just one, really, which I don't see as a negative. Um, I don't know if Andrew does. So who, 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 who here has used uh, Selenium before, back in the day? I should have started with that question at the beginning of the evening. That would have like, helped a lot. OK. So what the great thing about Selenium, I thought, was Selenium Grid using different browsers and those sorts of things. How many people here tested on multiple browsers? Yeah, that's, it's usually a smaller number. So I've done it on a couple of projects, but most projects say, oh, we'll do it later, we'll do it later. As long as we've got test coverage on one browser, it, we don't need another browser, it's fine. We can do that later when we get time, and time never happens. So one of the limitations at the moment with Cypress is it only works in the, is it the Chromium? So Chrome, Chromium, and there's a couple of others, but all kind of the same sort of similar flavor. So that's one of the downsides. I haven't seen it as an issue, but just thought I'd, I'd share that and let you know. I suppose one thing you can consider as well, if you are using Cypress and you do need the cross-browser, you could still run Selenium at the moment if you wanted to, just on a smaller subset of tests. It's so where we have had clients that have said, actually, we really need to make sure that it works cross browsers, even if it's just a case of the JavaScript all loads up without an error occurring on the page. You might still want to use Slender for a couple of happy path tests. Hit each page perhaps just once. Don't necessarily test the functionality, just make sure that there's no errors occurring. And then, yeah, just run everything else through Cypress, because so long as the page are loading and there's no errors coming up, then generally you're probably OK. But yeah, there could still be some hidden things that you're doing with a certain browser inside the JavaScript. But again, not really experienced that problem on any large scale project. Depends on the framework you're using as well, because, because a lot of what we focus on typically in our day jobs is more Angular than React, perhaps. Angular very much enforces a certain way of working, so you're, you've got less freedom to break across browsers as well. So there are a few protections in there, but 
I know other frameworks have less of those protections because they want to give you more freedom to do things. I have one last question before you jump in. Do you want to stop the, feel free to stop the laptop. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, uh, who here has a project that they, if you've got time at the end, which I'm hoping there is, wants to kind of, I don't know, try something new on their project with Cypress or has a new project they want to start and put Cypress on it? Does anyone have any, I guess, stuff they want to do? Not saying up here. I'm just saying when we're wandering around, if you want to try anything or, yeah, OK, cool. Well, you're welcome to come up and we can go through it together. It's up to you. Yeah. Cool. Okay, we've got a few people. So, and we can always pair up. If everyone hasn't got a project, just pair up with somebody. And uh, it's really interesting to see what, sorry, it's really interesting to see what, um, you know, people are working on, how people have done things. Because I keep saying to Andrew that we should um, open source some of our step definitions because I think there's a lot of repeatability between projects. Yes, there is some custom stuff, but filling in the form with all the selectors, maybe having it so that you want to find a sibling from the form because the form, for whatever reason, might not have an ID, but you want to find, I guess, the label. All these sorts of things. So, yeah, pressure Andrew into open. So he's got some great step definitions uh, for drag and drop, for images, and all sorts of stuff. I, mean, I think we should open source those. And uh, you can do that today in the half an hour I have at the end, right? We'll get around to it. OK, so I'll leave you cool. to it. Get out of the way. I can have a go. Yeah, uh, so obviously Eddie's gone through all the stuff he's gone through just now. Uh, there was something I was going to ask that brought to my mind, but you've made me forget now, so no. it may come back later. It's all right. Me. No, no, there was something I was going to say, but uh, I let you carry on, so I forgot what it was, but it's fine. Uh, if it comes back, I'll mention it. Okay, so Eddie mentioned about setting up the file, so there's a couple of things to just do. Uh, as you had that on the slides, I won't go over it too much, but in your package, Jason, important things are Cypress, so npm install for Cypress, make that a bit bigger, uh, and Cypress Cucumber preprocessor. So get those two installed. Once they're installed, you then can add this little block of code up here, so Cypress Cucumber preprocessor, not the private line, I've highlighted too much. So the Cypress Cucumber preprocessor, um, just do exactly what's there, don't ask questions why. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, to set up the files, as Eddie said, test files, so I use the star star feature as well, so it'll look into any fo files in that um, folder for being, when I say that folder, this integration folder. So integration folder is the one where you're going to put the feature files. This tells it only look at ones that are called feature because some people do like to put, say, their mock files as well in the same directory so they keep the mocks with the feature files. I do still keep them separate. So the mocks, which are called fixtures inside here, so that might be a JSON call to a back end to say, I want to get this JSON file back or I'm going to mock out an error occurring. Um, so that's in the fixtures, as Cypress calls them, but I, I still call them mocks just to align with my back end because typically on the back end, I'd call them mocks, so I just like them to be the same. Um, plugins, um, I don't tend to add any many plugins apart from, uh, from Cucumber, so that's the only one that you'll find in there if I was to open up what's in the plugins folder. Uh, all you'll see is an index file that just says turn Cucumber on. Again, that's what Eddie had in his slides. Um, what else have we got this of note? Um, again, you can set up screenshots. Uh, we do need for um, Cucumber the support folder, and there will also be from the package JSON this step definitions folder. So that why they're in two different places, I don't know. They should really put them in the same file. It would make life a bit easier to remember. Um, but yeah, you put the step definitions in one, and then in Cypress, you've got to tell it, load the support files from the support folder, which is generally Cucumber's world um, object. Um, videos, yeah, we can set up different viewport heights. That's your browser size when the browser loads up. So I'm just going for desktop in this example here, where it's 1920 by 1080, but you can set up multiple ones of those. So what should we look at? Let's have a look. So we've got a couple of feature files that we've written. So this current project is actually the Code Mortals website. For those that haven't seen it, I can quickly bring that up. That's Cypress's docs as I was trying to figure out what's going on. So we're going to just test against this. Um, so this is the website. You can see it live, Code Mortals. We're going to basically just be testing this contact form is what we're going to go through and how we can populate that. Uh, and that's what we're going to look at. So I'll go back to here. So the first file here is just check the landing page works for a really small, simple file. And this is, again, it's in that Gherkin syntax. So we can see we've called it just opening the website's landing page. And the scenario is going to be that we just want to make sure the page is loaded, really. Uh, so we're going to open the page, and we just want to check that the title says code mortals. Now, what goes on behind that? I could run it, and you can see it. But what happens behind it? So 
A couple of things first. So the first thing is that back in this Cypress JSON, we have to tell it where the base URL is. So this is what's where we're going to run it from. So local host, and that's hosted up down in my terminal. Uh, so again, I've just run the project. It's just running on a local server, and that's running on port 8080. So if you wonder where is it getting where to go from, it's in that config. And inside the step, okay, I've got to zoom all these in because they come out small to start with. Um, so we're calling this top one. So when I opened it up, it's highlighted the top step is the one we're using given so-and-so page is open. So that's the CY visit. We just give it the path. So the path in this case was just forward slash. And it's getting that base URL to know it's on port 8080 from our config. Uh, the next step that was going on was that we were making a check. So there's this then here to say that we're including that check on the page. We're just using a should for an include. So it's just looking at the title. Somewhere within that title, it's looking for the word code mortals. And title there is the title on the page. So in your head, title tag, just validating that that title tag is set correctly. And the last step we're not using in this particular test file. Um, again, another really simple one, just showing another one saying, we've got a missing, we're trying to go to a, a non-existent page. And again, same kind of thing. In this case, we're looking for a head tag. So we're saying there should be an H2. So again, it's getting the body of the page. We're getting the whole page to start with. We don't, didn't have to do that. We could have actually just gone straight to the getting the H2. Um, but just trying to give an example there. If you wanted to find a wrapper with something inside it, how do you do that? That body could have easily been another element on the page because I might have multiple H2 tags on there. Uh, but in this case, we just wanted to show you. You could find the body, get the H2 tag out and say, right, What's the H2 tag in this case? Whatever the test was looking for, I think it was just looking for a error 404 being mentioned on the page. Okay. So yeah, the within is the important thing. So anything that happens then is going to be within that tag. Um, but then the getting down the bottom. So this was our check. So then there are so everything in here. These are written in regular expressions. Important to just note that down. So down here, this part is looking for a number. So slash d. And then inside here, it's looking for a string, anything that doesn't have a quotes inside it, so a quote would end that uh, validation on the regex. I assume everyone's reasonably familiar with regular expressions. So we, we can do a regular expression class at some point if you like. But uh, yeah, everything. You can write Cucumber with just curly brackets, like saying curly bracket string, but that brings down lots of problems down the line. So we end up using regular expressions always for this stuff. Uh, and then the contact form. So this is the one that. Uh, I was just trying to knock together. So literally, I, I put these tests together today. That's when I've been doing this. And I was just trying to get the last part to work by calling an, a fixture to show a fixture. But um, it's not quite working. I'll show the code that I've got there. Um, perhaps anyone in the room might spot the obvious mistake I've probably made. Um, but otherwise, essentially, what we've got here is a form. So we're going to the contact page. We're looking for a field. So in this case, we're actually looking for the label on the field. So it's labeled as your name. Uh, and we're going to set that to a value of automated test. Likewise, a few more fields on the page. Then we're going to hit the button, and it should show a thank you. Uh, now, because I've turned off the fixture, it's actually going to call the real API. Um, so I will actually get an email that comes through when this gets sent. By mocking that out, I wouldn't get the email normally, because I could just validate, did the mock get called correctly? But so there's just, yeah, I've not quite had enough time to get that just fixed up and uh, figured out why it's misbehaving. I was going to add, add to that that... I mentioned before about uh, mocking certain things. So what we would do here if we had, say we had to test this form five different ways because it would go for different people depending on, I don't know, maybe there was a subject drop down. Um, so what I would do here for speed and performance is have it, so if there's a drop down of five different kind of categories, they went to five different emails, I'd probably do one real test to make sure that it does get received end to end. And then the other four, I'd mock them out just to make sure that the request is being sent, but it's probably being sent to the same API so that there's no need to actually do the real end to end because it makes it a lot slower. So when you're doing the full end to end test, definitely do the full end to end. But if you start going slow and you've got you know, 10 or 20 tests around the same area, there's no point testing the same thing each time. Does that make sense? Have I explained that really badly? Like if the email address changes and it changes on the API side, there's no point the UI making the kind of the same request with a different string changing. You might as well just test that once and then mock it out every time. So still do the other tests, but they'll be mocked out the one a lot faster. And there is another way that you can do it as well. You could literally have exactly the same set of tests, no change at all, but you could have a flag, uh, an environment variable perhaps, that you check in your tests. So at the end of the day, it's just JavaScript, right? So we could inside this 
this here is the bit that I'm, I'm trying to fix, but we could wrap this around something to just say, if we're running in, I don't know, integration test mode, then actually we're not gonna run any of the fixtures, we're just gonna hit the APIs directly, and then you could have exactly the same test suite, just one that's in integration mode, but then you would be hitting every single time for the API, rather than just as Eddie's saying, have one test hit the API and the rest of them knock it out. Uh, the downside is obviously if you're hitting the API, you're trying to do complicated things that the API wouldn't normally respond to, like 404 errors for credentials not matching, and you've got all the correct credentials, and you need to put a bad API key in, you probably wouldn't be able to test that, so you might have to then start putting tags. So Cucumber supports tags, so you might have a, a set of tags that just say these are the integration suite tests to run. So in integration mode, just run the tagged ones for integration and don't call our fixture, our mocked API. Um, so there are things you can do around that as well. If you I was going to ask, does anyone actually do anything like that? We interested to know from other people's experience, either in, in Selenium or in Cypress, what kind of challenges have you, have you had and how have you got around them? We're really interested to know. Just shout it out, don't be shy. Or has it always gone perfectly smooth, smoothly and it just works first time and everything's great? Oh, brilliant, can I come work on your projects? They sound good, because I get lots of challenges every time. It's meant to work, and then, yeah, you get some challenges. And So I, I didn't show quickly how we're looking for this. So this one's a slightly more complicated one. So this time, we're, when we're trying to find the input field, um, because all of the IDs for, and, and the ways you would normally look for an input are all, faked out, so it might say, it, to make them unique, they're things like um, site input one or something, site input two, and you won't necessarily know what they're gonna be because they'll be randomly generated. Instead, we're looking at the label. So in this case, the test is find the form on the page. Inside that form, find a label that contains the name we're looking for. So your name might be the, the field it's looking for. And then it uses this siblings to find something on the same level as that label, grabs the input, in that case it's clearing it, and then down here, same thing, it's clearing it, and then it's saying, right, make sure it's empty, and then type, this word type, fills the field with the content that you want. Uh, so I'll just run that up. So Cypress, um, I've got a little, let me just quickly show that first, actually, before we go into running it. I've um, got a couple of scripts in here. So because we're using Angular, um, we build the project first using an ng build that runs it as a, in, um, still in a local host effectively, rather than the prod build, which uses a different config file. So we could have a test config file in there for, for this. Uh, and then there's just two simple things, Cypress open and Cypress run. We're gonna use Cypress open first, just to so you can see the interface running up. But Cypress run gives you a CLI method of doing it, which is what you would run on your CIs when you're running it, when you want to run it on a CI, unless you happen to be running something with a uh, desktop interface that you might consider using. Cypress Open, it is sometimes quicker, so, but Cypress Run is what we normally run on a server. So this is Cypress opened up, it lists up, it's found the feature file, so it knows that's what it was looking for, as we define those in our config. Uh, we could run one of them, I'm just gonna run them all first, and just check that it actually does tech pass. Fingers crossed. Uh, it does take it a moment, um, you'll see down the bottom there, it's busy loading up a load of stuff, there we go. Right, so that's the, the contact form being filled out, and did I leave that in? I might have left something in there that I need to take out. Uh, what did I leave in? Gotta love it when a live demo doesn't work. Yeah. And just the brave one. I'm hiding back here. Well, it was working a second ago when I turned this all off, so I'm not sure why I've just gone unbroken again. I'm just gonna properly turn those off. Uh, I'll tell you what, I might not be if you spot it, shout it out. Andrew won't be offended, don't worry. <laughs> uh, we haven't taken the keys out, that's all still there. Running that local build. So I'm just thinking, uh, I might need to put these keys back in. Okay, here. while you're doing that, I have a question for everybody as well. Has anyone done anything kind of crazy in that they try to use the same uh, tests on the front end as well as the API? Anyone, <coughs> anything like that? I've done it on a small project, but not on a, on a large project, in that if I was logging in, for example, rather than, I'd have my, my, cucumber, my Gherkin not be so specific rather than I'm on the home page. It would be, uh, I'm, I, and I'm trying to log in and I use the username and password and, and then I, I send the request. I, or I send the request and then on, I have the same uh, Gherkin on the front end, but the step definition behind it is obviously uh, going to a, a UI and then having the same cucumber on the back end to test it as well, but the step definition is actually making a, a post request and it's going to an API. 
and then that way you can have the same on both, but obviously the step deaths are different. Has anyone tried anything like that? Tried to, I guess, reuse a lot of the tests? No, just me? I use it on a small project, and I haven't used it on a large one, so I was just curious if anyone's done anything, something similar. But no. Okay. That, reusing steps. Yeah, that was, not yeah. Re, uh, reusing the gherkin rather than the steps, and the steps would change. But the... Um, the oh, yeah, the stuff you've spoken to me about a few times, yeah. yeah okay, it keeps so shooting me down. Time. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting concept because you could have literally a completely different set of steps yeah. driving something completely different but the same gherkin statements. It's an interesting idea. It, we'll keep it as an idea yeah, for I now. think you're, you're ahead of the days. So that's what it is. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it works for a few tests. I don't know, for a large project, though. Cool. So that all passed this time. I, I needed to put the correct config in because I was calling a real back end rather than a, a fake one. Um, so... One of the nice things, as Eddie said earlier, we can now actually inspect through this. If one of these had failed, and I probably could have left the failure on, um, we can actually click into it and we can step through at a particular point in time and see what happened. So in this case, I'm clicking on <coughs> finding the label. You can see it's highlighted what it's looking for. You can turn that off. There's, there are some little interfaces down the bottom, so we could turn that off if it's blocking something we want to see on the page. But you can see what, it, what uh, Cypress is actually doing as it's finding things on the page, looking through. You can step back through every single step, see what was going on. Uh, it should have also recorded a video. Oh, I've got the video set up, right? Um, That's a great website. So I could also go into here. I don't know why it's got schedule feature. That, oh, this might be, this may be an old version of me running this, but let me open it up anyway. You can see an old version of the site. So again, so if you wanted to pass someone a video of what was going on on the site at a particular point in time, so this is one from about three weeks ago where it calls through. It's got a failure in there. Um, yeah. So there are videos that get recorded, which can be quite nice on our CI. We store all our videos, and sometimes people say, oh, what was happening six months ago for this particular feature? How's it changed? And you can play out the video and see everything in detail. Uh, what else do we have on here? So site back to Cyprus. Uh, we can step through. The error I was getting was down here. We could have a look, and I could actually put that back in if you want to see what was going on. Um, and maybe someone wants to shout and say, have you tried this? Because you missed it. Um, but I think what it is, a while ago on this project, we were playing around, as you saw from those old tests, and that was using Firebase's Firestore, and we were mocking things out in a funny way. I think I've got a setting hidden somewhere that I've forgotten what it is and need to turn off. Um, but either way, if I put that back into the contact file, I can put this in. So this is what I was trying to do, was just mock it out to say, given there's going to be a post of some sort expecting a call to, don't really care where it is, but the last part should be this SendGrid contact email because we're using SendGrid to send the email. Um, then we want to return this success JSON, which is here, and it just says done true. So this is coming from our Firebase function that we've written ourselves. That's on our <coughs> back end. We have a Firebase function. It's just going to send back a done uh, normally, so that would be the expected response. Uh, as I said, in theory, it should work, but if I run this at the moment, you'll see. Uh, so Cypress, again, it monitors changes, so I didn't have to hit anything. I'll just tab back over. The files got saved. Um, I'm not sure why that has gone past. <laughs> it worked. You fixed it. Thanks, everyone. I'm now intrigued, but... I wasn't paying attention. I was changing the batteries in one of the cameras. Oh, I think what it is is... Um, Cyp it, it, because I've got my back end running locally, uh, Cypress is not finding the mock file is the issue. It's, it seems to be ignoring the mock. And because I've got my back end running, it's hitting the back end and still sending. So I'm probably getting lots of emails coming through. Which is probably why my watch just pinged. Um, but if I turn the back end off, then we should see a failure. So this is the back end. And I can just rerun that. And what you'll see come through is it a couple of things as I'm logging out down the bottom. There we go. It's hit this issue here where Cypress normally, if you've got working mocks, it will strip out any options calls for calls. Um, but I can see that there's a calls request for this options going through up here, which should not be in the log because if Cypress was picking it up and interfa interfacing with it, then the options call doesn't occur. So I can see, okay, it's called the local host. The server's off because I've just turned it off. It's thrown an error. Nothing came through. And that's where it's blowing up because it's not hitting the mock file. But yeah, if, uh, if I had another half hour or so, I might better figure out what's going on. Say, so, Levy, that's my fault for 
having too much fun over the Christmas break. <laughs> I apologise, Eddie. And everyone else, we'll, we'll try and get that working again. Uh, one of the other things I can now do, though, so you've seen it running locally, what I could do is I could actually take this exact same set of tests and with minimal change apart from just taking that mock out, I could point this at our production server, which I'm going to do now. So just in the Cypress JSON here, I can change this. And I can say, go to instead co-mortals. And these configs can right. be changed when you run the command. You can pass it in and overwrite this. So you wouldn't actually have to change the file if you wanted a certain, uh, I don't know, every midnight or when a certain branch changes or something to, to run yeah. against, that, against the real website. So the only thing I have had to do, because I changed the core config without doing what Eddie just said, I have to stop and start Cypress again for it to reload that config. But aside from that, I should be able to run this now. And we should see as this runs at the URL in the URL bar here, it's no longer pointing at local host. It will be pointing at the server. And with any luck, the exact same test we should pass because it's the same code that's up on there. I should get the email as well. Yeah, apart from it, I should put notifications up. Oh, that's interesting. We tested that before. That worked. That's very interesting. I did work earlier. What have I done today? <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll get someone to pair with you and we we'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we can fix that later. If anyone wants to come crowd around me, we'll try and figure out why it didn't work in a sec. But yeah, it uses the exact same code. It should be going through. Because I did turn that off, didn't I? I did save it. Fopa saved it. And it, while Andrew's doing that, I just want to also say that on top of the scenario, you can also add tags. It's the same in, in Selenium. So if you wanted to have, uh, what's the word? not obstructive, what's the word, Dest destructive uh, tests that you wouldn't run if you were running against your production site. Say you wanted to have a certain amount of test suites that did some user journeys. That could, you, could you go to the checkout and could you do these sorts of things? You um, can put at uh, destructive and then, or you probably put the opposite, and then you'd run that suite against production, but you wouldn't run the destructive ones because... Uh, you, you wouldn't want it to actually do certain things, actually do uh, certain things on production, like delete users or delete something. So uh, I don't know if you want to quickly show that when you get a second. Uh, on where, sorry? Uh, if you go to the, uh, the, the Gherkin on the test. Yeah. You just want to say, above scenario, you can just put a tag, like at, All right, yeah. uh, at I don't know, important or at happy path, whatever you want to call it. And then when you're on your CI, when you run it, if you pass in uh, the flag to go actually go to your production URL rather than your development or local environment, local as in on CI, you could just run with the tags, the happy ones, you don't do anything that's destructive. So you can do things like that as well. And someone asked about best practices earlier on with the folder structure. I thought of another one that is not to do with folder structure. But when you raise your PRs for your features, definitely include the relevant tests. So um, Andrew mentioned when you go back in time and look at I don't know, a tag or a branch, you've got all the relevant code, test, and ideally documentation. And if you want um, ever a, a talk on documentation, and that's another thing I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about is automating kind of your documentation using things like ASCII docs or Markdown with something like ASCII doctor that builds a PDF and a website uh, and all the rest on CI. Yeah, I mean, structure-wise in here, I've broken these down in the step definitions of actions, so things like button inputs, clicking on links, um, browser-related stuff, so anything that controls the browser, in this case, opening a particular page or header metadata go, is in there at the moment. Uh, Content-related stuff, so things I'm looking for on the page. Anything that's data-related, so this is mocking out the data, the back end. And then anything that's form-related is in here. If there were then custom components that we'd built, there'd be a file for each component. So if we'd built a custom date picker, for example, there'd probably be one that's for date picker-specific things you might want to do, like navigating forwards and backwards through months, selecting a day, so forth. And then, yeah, as Eddie says, in the actual um, feature file, normally I'd have a folder probably for each one, so each section, so contact would probably be a folder rather than just being a file in here. And then you'd have your happy path, sad path, um, and so forth inside. That would be how I'd normally structure out the features. But the nice thing is what we've got is a lot of reusable stuff there. So once, and this is where, it, it can be bad for developing skills around writing Cypress. Once you've written them once, you tend to not touch those files very much. You tend to just be spending all your time writing feature files and just adding in those. And very quickly, you can build up a 1,000 tests on probably 30 or 40 step definitions. 
um, which is one of the really nice things about uh, having that combination, not having to constantly write the Cypress stuff and figure out why is that not working here when it did work over there. Because um, we've got it working in one place, it should work everywhere. You can enrich them though, which is also another really fan great thing about Cypress is that once I've written a test, like I've done an input test, and now everywhere I want to just validate that inputs have a specific error message or a certain color to them, rather than going through the entire code base and all your tests and updating every single one to say, right, make sure that it's got that there and there and it's on all of them. In one place, we can check all inputs in just by making one change, then it's all centralized, um, which is probably the most powerful part of Cucumber in doing that. I was going to say one more thing and I've forgotten now. Oh, no, come back to me later. Any questions? Yeah, uh, so I'm using circle at the moment on here, so I can show exactly what that's doing. So circle in here, uh, this is all open source. You can look at the whole project is open source. Uh, but effectively on circle, um, this is the test block here. So circle has a, well, I say circle, there's a Docker image for Cypress. Um, so we use the, that Docker image to start with. If that, bit, that gives you all the dependencies that Cypress needs on a system. Uh, we're checking out the code. In this case, there's a cache that's being held for NPM. And then it, it's just running this command. So we're just seeding into the hosting folder. So because we've got both a front end and a back end in one project here, we're going into there, we're just calling NPM run test, which if I open that up, uh, is this one. So NPM run test is here. So there's a couple of things it's doing. The first thing it's doing is running a lint check. Uh, the next thing it's doing is building up the project using that build test, so just like I would do locally. And then I'm using concurrently to load up both Cypress and start the server. So it's still running it effectively locally on the CI, but by using concurrently, we can load both of them up in parallel. And because the, the server starts up really quick compared to Cypress, which takes about 10, 15 seconds to get started up, uh, we know the server's going to be there first. We don't have to run any checks, really. I mean, if you manage to figure out how to speed Cypress up and it was starting faster than the server, great. We then have to put something in to make sure that the server's there. I have just started moving my open source startup to GitHub Actions from Travis. I don't use Circle, I use Travis. And Cypress has actually solved this a different way, which I've just figured out, noticed today mm -hmm. in their documentations. They do it so uh, in the GitHub Actions, they have a, um, certain steps. And you say, the command to start my application is this command. And then what it will do, it will run that command, wait for it to be available on 4,200, or whatever port that you, that you specify. And then it will start Cypress. And then when Cypress finishes, it kills what it had started. So therefore, it manages it for you. So that's, that's really nice. Um, I don't know if there's maybe a newer version of the Docker container that does something like that. But I noticed that today on GitHub Actions, and that was quite cool. So um, yeah. Has anyone used GitHub Actions before? Yeah, I just started using it last week for the first time, and I really, really like it. Really well, we've cool. seen a couple of projects using it as well. We had to play around, so we're keen to get a bit more on that. Just all being in one place is really nice. I really Give like us it. a couple more weeks to figure it out a bit more, and we might do a session on GitHub Actions. Or if anyone else wants to do a session on GitHub Actions, yeah. you're more than welcome to. Uh, anything else around Cypress-related questions at the minute? Yeah. Uh, so, when I say other report, you can see this one. So I, I ran that up as within a, an interface, so you can run it on the command line as well. So rather than, call, well, I'll do the one that's up here. So up here, we've got a Cypress run command, which is wrapped in NPM with the Cypress run. So if I just run that as well, you'll see down the bottom in the terminal that I can't, I don't think I can make that any bigger, can I? No. Um, so this is running now just on the CLI, so you'll see the exact same kind of output occurring. Um, and anything that's been logged out will all come into this log as well. And this is what you'd normally run on the CI, so your CI would show you all of this. Um, and this is where the, you get the video. So I, I haven't run the run mode locally for a while, hence I had the old videos. So this would be overwriting my videos now as well, because you don't get the videos when you've got the interface running. Uh, but there you go, that all ran through, it all passed. Um, which is interesting, because I think I'm still pointing at the Code Models website, but it didn't run from the interface. Um, so I think far, there are other reporting plugins you can use. Uh, there in the, on the Cypress website, there's a whole uh, plugin section. And I remember seeing other reporting, because I think there's, 
the other format, I want to say JUnit, but that's so wrong. There's, there's something from like the Java standard. It's not Java, but it's the, uh, the, the format and the results and so forth. So you can then put it into other, other uh, things to consume the data. So there are other reports I think you can do as well. So there's the video, and uh, we can see in the video it's calling the website, and it actually passed here, so I must have done something wrong on my okay. rerunning of Cypress. Something's not behaving right on here at the moment. But the Cypress run is a bit more consistent than the UI. So. Is that the video? Do you want to press play again? That's the video. I can play it again. Oh, I missed it. Was it really, it was 10 seconds? OK. I was too not busy talking. Long. So yeah, this is the video that Cypress run is recording. So you, you can capture these artifacts, keep those on your CI, along with the script that's here. Um, they're the main things you get, and that does give you that little report at the end that just says these are all the tests, how many ran, how many passed, failed. Um, gives you a time as well for each, as each one runs through, or telling you how long each one is. But this is where Cypress run is slower. So the UI runs faster, but it seems less consistent, something I have noticed. Um, I haven't noticed it on this particular thing with fixtures, though, so that's interesting. But um, yeah, it does seem to be a bit slow when you're using it from the command line. Command line, I've been very consistent. Well, I've not seen any false negative positives as such going on. Yeah, yeah, it's always, it's always been very consistent. If I was to bring up, I can bring up the CI. It was more about the timings. It is, in the, 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 is it consistency oh, how slower? Cool. Yeah, it, it is, and I don't know why. I thought it would be the other way around. I thought being headless would be faster. Yeah. But I don't know what else it does in, in the background. Something, it's running inside of Electron when it boots up on the browser, on the desktop. So I don't know if they've got if it's got more efficiency inside of Electron, but it is odd. You might agree. use the graphics card. First time I ran it, I thought it was funny. It could yeah, be that it's that's, picking that's, up video. There are there are extra things it's doing. Yeah, it could well be. Could turn I'm not turn, spending enough time perhaps trying to turn things like that off. Yeah, you could turn it off in a config and see. Actually, I might do that on the train home. That's a good yeah. idea. I bet you wish that actually, because the video on CI when it writes the videos, you can definitely see that that part takes time. Well, you know it does take a second, because at the end, it does say at the end, it's now processing the video. So it's capturing it, but I wouldn't have thought it should have that significant. When it, you're looking at like one and a half seconds versus 100 milliseconds mm. normally, it, that seems a very significant performance. But maybe. Go on, sorry. I think there's more questions I saw leaning. No, no question? OK. okay. Uh, we thought you had a question. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no worries. And the other, the extreme before, like, since you have Yeah, that's one of the things we like. I mean, certainly, again, in here, you can see the, the headlines coming through. Um, this, which one is the content one, which has a couple of steps in it. Uh, I'm pretty sure I remember a while ago seeing that you can get, instead of sending someone the dot .feature files, you can get like a PDF or something generated oh, all the of them. Yeah. Okay. And you can then send that to someone so they can read through it. They can't run it or do anything with, with it, but they can you know, read through about what features are there and maybe what's missing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, the nice thing is once you get a decent set of step definitions, you could give them to someone that has a dedicated testing role. I'm not a huge fan of having a testing role in an organization that's a dedicated person. You might have somebody that's, say, a quality assurance person is going to make sure consistently you're doing things a certain way. But having testing roles, I prefer to have the person that's doing it writing the full test code, the whole lot, get that reviewed in one block. Otherwise, you get out of sync between someone doing the code, someone doing the tests. And, um, but yes, in theory, once you've got a decent set, some organizations that really want to have the two roles separated, you could just say, well, here's the step definitions. You write the test to go with them. Um, and then you can write them in largely in English, which is great, certainly getting more junior people into the, the testing side of things. Does your IDE also complete the lines? Yeah, the, yeah so obviously when I start cool. writing, I can say. So if someone's new to the project, don't know what step definitions are available, you get auto complete. So they can, they can kind of start seeing what's available. If they want to see if something's similar, um, they can see other things. Lots of things start with the word the, so <laughs> I can pick something different. But it's, yeah, it's not just about the beginning. It's anywhere it found in that regex, which is quite good, containing. Yeah, so partly self-documented, but you need to vaguely know what's in there. Must remember that. That's that's good. Thank you. So just to repeat, if anyone heard, you can get HTML, JavaScript, uh, so JSON, 
And XML. That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. I think they call it, isn't the XML format called J? You know, it's coming from Java. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, and you've got uh, LCAF as well and things. Okay. Yeah, I've yeah, not got any coverage uh, reporting stuff set up on here. But yeah, we are using, in effect, uh, have I got Chai on this at the moment? I'm not sure if this project's got Chai in there yet. Um, no. no. But you can use Chai to do your assertions. Cypress comes with a lot of assertions built in, though, so you don't really need to do that. Uh, but on the back end, always use Chai for that. Eight o'clock. Did I'm you looking want at to... the clock. I think in break time, and then people can start yeah. doing a bit of coding, and we can wander around and just. Or if not, we can do some more work on here together and show a few other things. There's plenty more tests we can add on to here and do some live adding more tests. Um, let's take a let's break. See what take a ten-minute like break. At. People go get a drink. Use the yeah. toilet. So that was that was us talking. We're going to basically do more of a lab session after, where you will literally come round. You can have a look at some code together. We, you can get a few people around a, a laptop and look at one screen if. Uh, if not everyone's got something they want to look at. But, yeah. And if you haven't got anything to look at, we might have a really big client project that we won't put up on the screen, but you can gather around a laptop and yeah, we can take show off you the some screen and show real, it, yeah. more complicated tests and so forth, but we won't record it or share it. That's a good point, actually. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hey, your test is broken, what are you talking about? The, the, well, <laughs> yeah, the, the version that's currently up on GitHub works, but it's missing stuff for the contact form. Okay. Um, yeah. We'll we'll find some. If not, we'll create one. No, just Yeah. I mean, I've got my. I mentioned before my, my open source startup. That's got one, but that's I don't mock anything out. It depends what you want to look at because I'm using Firebase and all the real time stuff, and uh, I don't actually mock that out because Firebase just doesn't use JSON to send data back and forth, which is a real real pain. As much as I love Firebase, it's a real pain. So it does full end to end. So again, that's open source, and I can I can show you that, and if you want to see it. Does anyone here use Firebase? Does anyone here test Firebase and maybe mock it out? Can you do that and let me know how to solve that? We spent a while looking at it, and the well, data we did, gets we did get it mocked out because it was on here. That we were mocking it out, but it was a very dirty way of doing it. Yeah, it's I've got a cleaner idea, but I need to. Okay. I need about three days to build it, probably. It, it's weird. It's not JSON, which is a real pain in the communication. It's not true WebSocket either. So it's kind of, it's this kind of hybrid, which is great. It seems to be really fast when you're using Firebase, but to test it, yeah, I kind of, I'm struggling with it at the moment. Cool. Okay. Have a comfort break, and we'll wander around and see what people are working on. I'll just stop the live stream, maybe. Yeah, we could do. I don't think people are going to want to sit and watch people go. No. Um, and also, I want to turn this off. <laughs>